Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop, and this week's episode is for the audio nerds, or the would-be audio nerds. Yes, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, compression, dynamic range compression, how to use it for mojo, for tone, for utilitarian effect, all sorts of stuff. And we're going to be diving into three relatively more advanced types of compression, namely parallel compression, serial compression, and sidechain compression. I kind of want to do another episode at some point soon that'll be all about bus compression and subgroup compression. I think that warrants a topic in and of itself. But for the purposes of this episode, I'm going to assume that you know what a compressor is, and what the basic controls on a compressor are. If you don't, man, I should probably do an episode all about that one of these days. I don't think I've ever done an episode that's super basic on compression. Maybe I should. I think when I think of Sonic Scoop readers and uh, our normal audience, I think of people who already know how to use a compressor and are just looking to go further and further. In fact, that's one of the guidelines I give to a lot of the writers for Sonic Scoop is that we're generally not writing for a super, super beginner audience. The one thing I'm going to assume that all of our readers have in common is they know what the basic controls in the compressor are. That said, maybe I'll do an episode about that sometime. So that was a big segue. So here we are on today's topic, which is a few of these advanced compression techniques. I actually have some really in-depth videos from a few years back on just parallel compression. I did a couple of those just on serial compression and just on side chain compression. And if you want to go really deep, you can check out almost an hour of audio and video examples I have on all three of those concepts for free. I did a three-part series with uh, B&H where I kind of went through some of that stuff. But I want to give a recap of these three ideas for those of you who might not have checked out those three videos or for those of you who might not know that you should check out those videos. Just going to give a primer on some of these more advanced compression strategies. Like I said, the majority of you probably know why does the compressor do? Well, it takes your dynamic range, the different difference between the quietest and the loudest signals you have, and it reduces it generally by bringing down the loudest signals and then bringing the whole thing up. But the more and more you play around with compression, the more and more you realize it can be used to creative effect, to kind of getting new textures, to getting a sound to come to life more, conform a little bit more closely to the vision that you have for that sound. And parallel compression, serial compression, and sidechain compression all are able to help you with that. Now, before I get right into it, I'm just going to give a brief shout out to this week's sponsors. Check out Sound Toys. Soundtoys.com, one of my favorite makers of plugins, been po- sponsoring this podcast since the beginning. Soundtoys.com, try out everything they make for free. They have an amazing bundle of really creative effects, including what? Yes, compression. Some really interesting and really out there compression, too, especially in the form of the Devilock and Devilock Deluxe. Also, another cool maker of plugins sponsoring this uh, week once again, Eventide. Check them out, eventideaudio.com. Again, check out any of their software for free. And if you are looking for effects for a live situation, my goodness, their stomp boxes are crazy and amazing, as is their hardware. Last but not least, if you want to hear me go into even more depth about how to use compressors to break through to the next level, particularly in your mixes or in your mastering, check out my full-length courses, either Mixing Breakthroughs or Mastering Demystified. All right, now on to these three ideas. What is parallel compression? What is serial compression? What is sign chain compression? Let's define them, and then I'm going to kind of break down how and why you'd use each. So parallel compression, this is the one that's probably the most familiar to people, is you take an uncompressed signal, and then you kind of duplicate it or split it out and compress it really, really hard, and you blend those signals together. Generally, your uncompressed signal is going to be the dominant one, but your really, really compressed signal, you're going to fold up underneath that one. Serial compression is a slightly different but related idea. Parallel compression, you have two channels working kind of side by side. Serial is one channel going into another. So basically, you take your compressed signal, it goes into a compressor, and then that compressed signal goes into another compressor. In many cases, people use serial compression almost by accident without thinking about it because chances are you might put compression at some point on some individual instrument like a voice. That voice 
may end up going through a vocal bus that might have a compressor on it. That's a form of serial compression. And then that vocal bus may go with everything else into a mix bus that may get further compression. And then that might get sent to a mastering engineer who might apply further compression still. And then if that thing is ever heard on the radio, then it'll go through, you can be sure, a whole lot more compression on top of that. So that's the idea of serial compression. But when I talk about serial compression in this context, what I'm really thinking about is intentionally stacking compressors for a specific effect. And then last but not least, the uh, other one for today that I think goes along with these just interesting ways of routing compressors is sidechain compression. And that is using one signal to trigger the compressor on a totally separate track. Classic example of this is, you know, you have some narrator talking over a nature documentary and there's music playing in the background. And then when the narrator's voice comes up, the narr that narrator's voice will bring down the music automatically with no fader rises needed. And that was probably arguably one of the earliest applications of sidechain compression, that kind of thing. But today it's used to great effect in music and music production. And I'll bring up a few examples. And you can hear some of these examples in a lot more detail in some of the other videos. But uh, for those of you just listening in podcast form, this is a great primer and or refresher on these ideas. So parallel compression, I am going to give you the short version of one of my most popular videos ever about the secrets of parallel compression that most people don't realize are key to parallel compression. So here's the big thing I want to tell you about parallel compression. There are two things, maybe three things you should think about with your parallel compressed track. One is that for parallel compression to make any sense, where you have a really clean and uncompressed track and you're bringing up a heavily compressed track underneath it, thing number one is that you should be using a lot of compression on that parallel compressed track. This is not the time to go, oh, I've heard that to maintain a natural sound, you should only ever try to get a dB or two of compression. Nonsense. I want you applying an absurd amount of compression every time you think about doing parallel compression. Otherwise, what's the point of doing it in parallel? But that's not all. In general, I would recommend that for parallel compression, using a really fast attack time makes a lot of sense. And this is particularly true for one of the most popular places to use parallel compression, and that is on a drum kit. On drums, on your natural, raw, organic, acoustic drums, you're generally going to have a lot of transient, and the transients are going to be one of the most dynamically inconsistent parts, right? Every time a drummer hits with a different level of intensity on that snare drum, on that kick drum, the transient is going to be a significantly different level. The initial attack, you know, will really be a different level. And having a really, really fast attack compressor is going to help you smooth out those transients so you can get a more robotic drum machine-like feel out of your compressed track. And ultimately, isn't that what we're really trying to do with compression? We're trying to make, say in the case of drums, them sound kind of hyper real, right? You're trying to bring some consistency out of those drums. You're trying to make them, you know, really kind of strong and powerful. But the reason you're doing it in parallel is because you don't want to get rid of that beautiful, natural, realistic drum sound you have. So you have these two separate tracks, your one uncompressed one and your one hyper-compressed one, ideally with a really fast attack so you get really even transients so you can bring up some really solid, uniform, machine-like drums that are extracted from your natural drums underneath your organic drums. And then the last thing I will say on this, and I've said it before, I'll say it again, is when you're doing this kind of parallel compression, go ahead and be crazy with the EQ. Doing a 10 dB low end and high end boost on your parallel compressed track that you're just going to be sneaking in under your main track, that is totally okay. Like go wild with your parallel compressed track. Make it a caricature of what you think the drum should sound like. And then that's what you're folding in under your main track. This doesn't work only for drums. It'll also work for things like vocals. Motown engineers were, I believe, notorious for using parallel processing on vocals where you have a hyper compressed really bright and articulate vocal track that you'd fold underneath your main track a lot of people like to do something similar with bass where maybe there is a really kind of mid-rangey bass hyper compressed that's maybe even a little distorted added in to give a little definition to your bass you could do the opposite too. You could have a hyper-compressed low-frequency 
tilted channel of bass to make sure that your low frequency notes are going to be really consistent in level and impact and kind of bringing that up under your bass. That, which one of those approaches you take on bass, depends on what kind of role the bass is made to play in the particular track you're working on. In some tracks, the bass is going to be your lowest instrument with a kick drum sitting above it. In some tracks, the bass is going to be your uh, higher bass instrument with a kick drum, say, sitting beneath it. Remember, when it comes to bass, when it comes to the lowest bass instrument, there can be only one. It's like the Highlander, okay? So that's another thing. If you take only one thing away from this week's episode, that totally unrelated concept could be it. It's a very good one. All right, so that's the idea of parallel compression. Long story short, when you're doing parallel compression, you want to make your parallel compressed track a caricature of what the ultimate sound should be, and then fold in a little bit. And sometimes you just fold in enough where you don't even really hear a difference when you mute it, but you feel a difference. And sometimes if you want to be really aggressive, there are certain genres or styles or you know, mixed strategies where you want to hear a lot of that hyper-compressed track, and it's okay to go for a slightly more unnatural sound. And this can also be a fun way to work with not just live organic instruments like vocals, bass, drums, but it can just be a good strategy for messing around with synth sounds and with programmed drums. It can sometimes be a more intuitive and fun way to get your desired effect than just trying to do some modest processing on your main track. Sometimes it's a lot more fun and intuitive and effective to do some crazy processing on a parallel track. So when you're thinking about parallel compression, don't just think about the compression. It's parallel processing in general. Compression, which is going to be one of those factors that drive that processing. One last thing I'll say about parallel compression and parallel compressing drums in particular. When you are parallel compressing drums, some people will not send their cymbals to that parallel compressed bus. You do not have to send all of the elements in your kit necessarily to that parallel compressed bus. You might even just want to send only your kick and snare to that parallel compressed bus or only your kick snare toms, everything except for the cymbals, that kind of thing. Or maybe you'll just parallel compress your room mics. And some people will do this kind of thing to try to reduce the amount of, you know, spilkus that's going on in the high end, in the cymbals. And that can be a wise strategy because cymbals can be one of the most obvious places that you hear the sound of compression. So sometimes it will be warranted to cut cymbals out of your parallel compressed tracks completely and just do it to the most beefy percussive elements. And sometimes you may want to include the cymbals in that bus. All right, thing number two, advanced strategy number two for compression is serial compression. And this one, really common, like I said, you're probably doing it without even thinking about doing serial compression because maybe you have a channel that's going through multiple buses, it gets some subgroup compression, it gets some mixed bus compression, that kind of thing. But when I'm talking about serial compression, I'm talking about stacking compressors with a strategy in mind. And in general, When people do serial compression, it is usually because they want two different compressors that are doing two different things. And those two different things generally have something to do with either having different attack and release times or having different ratios or both. So one of the classic examples here, you'll, this is the one you'll see in all the audio magazines if you ever read audio magazines. Are audio magazines still thing? Do they print those or is it just all online magazines like ours? You tell me. But this is, if you, there were audio magazines and you're reading one, this would be the prime example number one. 1176 compressor into an LA-2A. Or sometimes you'll hear it reported, vice versa, LA-2A compressor into 1176. So the idea here is that your 1176 compressor is super fast and can do a lot of gain reduction. And your LA-2A is your iconic, somewhat slower, lower ratio compressor, which is a more gentle compression. And the idea here, if you're going, say, through the 1176, your fast high ratio compressor into your 
slower, lower ratio compressor. The idea is what you're really looking for in this context is the compression of that, that, that smooth, slower, low ratio LA2A compressor. That's really what you're looking for, that sound. But you have a signal that's so erratic in dynamic range that you don't want to feed it a hyperdynamic signal because it'll make that compressor react funny and do strange things and you'll hear it and it'll be less transparent. So what do you do? You just kiss it with a little bit of that fast high ratio compressor before going into your slower ratio compressor. And that's one approach. Some people though do the opposite. And what they're doing is, I just want to apply a little bit of gentle compression just for the tone of it. But you know what? That gentle compression didn't get me the dynamic range control I wanted. If I tried to get the dynamic range control I'd wanted, it would sound kind of weird and overdone. So what I'm going to do is get this little bit of subtle, you know, extra kind of girth from maybe a, a slower, fuller compressor. And now that will go into a faster compressor, maybe even a limiter to actually do the heavy lifting of dynamic range control. So you can do this either way. And either way can have similar effects. But this is not an uncommon thing to do, especially not in the context of, you know, mainstream modern music production, particularly pop, rock, hip hop, that kind of stuff, where particular tracks that really want to be constrained in dynamic range and really featured might go through two stages of compression, each one doing something different. One that's maybe more tonal and maybe bring out more attack, and one that's more focused on uh, limiting the dynamic range uh, to more of a degree. There is a way that I, though, like to use compression in series, and I talk about this in the course Mixing Breakthroughs and some other videos of mine, and that is to help control the transient response of problem tracks. So if you can think of the most nightmare drum tracks that you'll ever get You'll eventually get them if you mix live drums. They'll sound a little something like this. You will have drums that, A, don't really have enough attack or impact, like they don't really have a lot of punch, but whatever punch or impact they do have is kind of all over the place because the drummer's a little sloppy. He's, he or she is not like super tight. You know, every snare hit is really close to the same dynamic. They're kind of all over the place. And that happens with a lot of early drummers who are trying to go as hard as they can, but they can't really keep up as hard as they can all the time. So there's this overly dynamic thing going on in the drums. And maybe also the drums don't have the best tone. The attack is kind of choked. So how do you solve both those problems at once? You want to bring out more attack to give these drums more impact, but you also want to control the attack so that it's more even dynamically. Well, one thing you could do is parallel compression, which you talked about before, and that totally works on things like drums. But another thing that works is something like serial compression, where you go into one compressor that's really, really fast to help give you really even transients. Because in general, faster compressors will give you more dynamic control, and they'll especially give you more dynamic control on really transient, quick percussive sounds and initial attacks of things, which sometimes the most erratic dynamic uh, part of the signal. But then once you've smoothed out that attack, you want to bring even more of that attack and impact back. So what do you do? You go into a second compressor that has a slower attack. And slow attack compressors, man, they have the benefit of bringing up your attack, bringing up your initial impact, giving you, for lack of a better term, a punchier sound, something that's coming at you more, uh, something that's a little less subdued, a little bit more articulate. But the problem with those slow attack compressors is that they don't do as much dynamic control and they kind of miss controlling the transients. But if you're going through two compressors, Regardless of what the ratios are, they could just be both two to one or three to one compressors, and you're going through a fast one and a slow one. You can kind of get best of both worlds. And again, you could stack them really either way. You just get slightly different results and you want to play with them differently. I tend to prefer to go into a faster compressor first to smooth things out, and then the slower compressor second. Just as I would often generally prefer to go through a higher ratio compressor first and a lower ratio compressor second. So those are the two big things that people are often looking for with serial compression. One, having a high ratio and a low ratio compressor together to get the tone from the lower ratio one and the dynamic range control from the higher ratio one. 
or trying to really repair a bad attack envelope for the uh, lack of a better term terminology there. One that is kind of making sure that you have transients that are more consistent, and then one that's bringing the attack and those transients up for more punch, more articulation, more uh, impact, more clarity and definition. Before we move on to our last category, drums, again, obviously not the only example here. I can imagine a whole bunch of different situations in which you might use this kind of thing on a bass, on a vocal, on a guitar, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want to hear audio examples of this stuff, I'll link to some videos in the show notes below where you can hear some of this stuff in detail. All right. Third, last but not least, sidechain compression demystified here. Sidechain compression is when you have a compressor acting on one track, but that compressor isn't actually reacting to the track it's on. It's not being triggered by the track it's on. It's being triggered by some other track. I brought up the example of that narrator, you know, who voice comes in and it brings down the music. Well, the other very popular and obvious one that's mentioned these days is an EDM production, making room for a kick drum by sucking down other instruments. So let's give you a quick example here. Say your kick drum is having trouble poking through all these beautiful, luxurious pads you have or arpeggiated bass track that you have in you know, some EDM or electronic E track. What you might do is, hey, I want to compress these synthesizers or bass elements that the drum is having trouble poking through. I want to compress them whenever the kick drum hits. So when my kick drum hits, those things get pulled down, leaving more room for my kick drum. And this is, again, one of those things that can be done really subtly, where when you mute or bypass the sidechain compressor, you don't really immediately hear a difference, but as you keep on listening, you kind of start to feel a difference. And it can be subtle in that way, or it can be pretty extreme. It can be so extreme as to make you kind of seasick. And I've actually heard people use this to creative effect where they want to create a really kind of washy, sucky sound going on. And uh, I mean sucky in the sucking down way, sucky not necessarily in the terrible way that is a matter of taste. But yes, the idea is making space. And making space for a kick drum is an obvious one. Making space for a snare drum. That's something that I've done on, you know, kind of more rock tracks that have synth or heavy guitar elements that are just getting in the way a little bit of a snare or a vocal. And you can have the snare or the vocal pull down the other elements in the track. And you might want to group together multiple things that would all be pulled down together. So if you have your snare pulling down tracks, it might pull down a group of Every you might create a group of everything except for your drums and vocals, right? And the snare drum could pull down that group, or maybe just a group of all of your guitars, or a group of all of your synths. So you create that all synths group. You put a compressor off on it, but you use a side chain input on that compressor, which is a feature that most uh, digital compressors have built in. And if you want to see and or hear that in more detail, I got a video on that one too, linked in the show notes. So those are our three major compression strategies for advanced routing. You got your serial compression, you got your parallel compression, you got your sidechain compression. And when it comes to other advanced compression techniques, say Michael Brower's Browerizing technique that we talked about in earlier episodes, both in their interview with Michael Brower and our reprise where I talk about Michael Brower's bus compression setup today, those more advanced techniques are really just kind of variations on these, often using both parallel compression and serial compression together. And if you look at some of those advanced multi-bus compression techniques, that's really all that's happening. You've got serial compression in the form of subgroup compressors, or you could have these subgroup compressors. And in addition to that, a parallel compression group that maybe compresses some elements, or in some cases, all elements, and then those will feed together. I hope this quick podcast episode has been a useful one for you. For some of you, it might be totally new, mind-blowing stuff, and I might be going way too fast. And for some of you, this might be old new stuff you've heard about before, but it's a nice refresher. And hopefully, for those of you who fall into that latter category, there's a detail or two in here that you can take and apply to your work. And if not, I hope it's just been fun to listen to, but I bet you got something out of it. 
How would you have gotten this far in the podcast if you didn't? So thanks for listening. Another big shout out to our sponsors. Sponsor number one, Sonic Scoop. Check us out, sonicscoop.com. Like, subscribe, rate, review. If you're on iTunes or any of the other podcast formats, please consider clicking the old five stars, maybe putting in a sentence or two of review there. It really does help us spread this podcast to new listeners. Same story if you're on the YouTube or Facebook versions. Please subscribe, comment, give a like, ask questions. I read every single question that comes in. And if you want to email me, just shoot an email to podcast at sonicscoop.com. And if you liked me yakking this long, about principles that you can apply in your work right now, check out my full-line courses, Mixing Breakthroughs and Mastering Demystified. You can check them out at mixingbreakthroughs.com and masteringdemystified.com. If you want more of this stuff specifically around drums, also check out mixingdrums.com where our contributor Mike Major goes into his approach to parallel compression and many other things around mixing drums. Also, big thanks to Sound Toys making some of the best plugins in the known universe. Check them out, soundtoys.com, where you can try out anything they make for how much? Do you think $100, $500 will cost $800? No, for free. You can try out everything they make for free at soundtoys.com. Same thing with Eventide and all of their awesome software, the whole entire Eventide anthology bundle, which is huge and epic. You can check out for free at eventideaudio.com. And if you're in the market for some hardware effects, specifically stomp boxes and the like and rack effects units, one of the coolest companies out there. You know what's also the coolest? You for listening to this podcast. Thanks for hanging out with me. See you next time.